and we have attendees, uh, a good set of ten attendees. Good day in whatever time zone you're in. Uh, welcome to the International Association of the Study of the Commons third annual World Commons Week event. In fact, this is the closing event of the week, so it's exciting. Um, we, we've had another successful year of doing this now. Um, my name is Charlie Schweik. I'm a professor at the University of Massachusetts in the United States, and I'm, I'm a member of the International Association for the, Study of the Count, for the Study of the Commons Executive Council, and I'm an organizer of the World Commons Week 2020 event. Um, as you may know, World Commons Week is a global annual event celebrating and promoting both commons research and practice, and it has two primary components. Uh, the first is uh, coordinated local events around the world, and then the second is a set of regional or continental keynote webinars. This is the keynote webinar for the IASC Asia region, where Professor Aline Delaney will be giving an approximately 35-minute talk entitled Coastal Commons in Japan Today, a Sea Change, which will then be followed with 15 to 20 minutes of questions and answers. So I'd like to welcome Professor Delaney, as well as Professor John Poulin, who is the IESC's Regional Coordinator for Asia. John helped organize this event and will act as the question and answer moderator. To ensure that the webinar functions well, um, we've limited video to the speaker and the moderator, and the audio, attendee, the audio for the attendees is muted. But um, that said, um, the, the attendees on the call, um, you have the ability to ask a question anytime during the session. Um, if you use your mouse and you scroll down on your Zoom screen, um, you should see a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. It's typically there. And, and that's the function to use to type in your questions. After the talk, John will read your questions to Professor Delaney. If it appears that we need to have a dialogue between you and the speaker, I'll unmute you. So at this point, let me turn it over to John to introduce our speaker. Um, John, thanks again for doing this. Thank you very much, Charlie, and good morning to everyone. In behalf of the Asia Regional Chapter of the International Association for the Study of the Commons, or IASC, I wish to welcome you all in this World Commons Week Asia webinar. My name is uh, Juan Pulhin, or John, professor at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos, and currently the IASC Regional Coordinator for Asia. It is my pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished speaker for this webinar in the person of Dr. Aline Delaney. Aline is an associate professor at the Center for Northeast Asia Studies of Tohoku University. She served as the editor of the Commons Digest for many years. A cultural and environmental anthropologist by training, Aline began her graduate studies working with fishing cooperative members in Northeastern Japan, where she focused on access rights, rights to fishing grounds, social networking, and personal autonomy. After more than 15 years working on coastal community and fisheries management projects, and in advisory roles in Europe, particularly at the Institute for Fisheries Management in Denmark, Aline returned to Japan to focus her Japanese research, where she continues using comparative perspective. Among her current research projects include, among others, studies on the revitalization of the commons, disaster and community resilience, coastal cultural heritage, and Arctic Japanese connections in the fisheries. Ladies and gentlemen, to discuss to us her topic titled Coastal Commons in Japan Today, a sea change. Let us all welcome Dr. Aline Delaney. Aline, the floor is yours. Thank you, John. Thank you, Charlie. It's my great pleasure to be here and actually from Japan. Um, I was in Europe uh, due to Corona for a number of months, so it's good to be back. I'll just share my screen. 
Mm. Yes. And hopefully everybody could see that. So yes, we coastal can. commons in Japan today, a sea change. Um, so currently in Japan, there's a new fisheries law that's being enacted. And so this is one of the things that kind of got me started thinking on, on this issue. Also, as John mentioned, I've, um, I've been working with uh, commoners and commons issues since the start of my career. And um, I remember my, my uh, graduate advisor, I said I wanted to look at change. And he laughed at me and he said, you can't see change. Um, but I, I actually think, especially um, in the current environment that we're all living in, actually we can see change going, you know, you know, in real time, not just in a historical perspective. So, but today um, we'll talk a little bit about the coastal commons. I'm giving a very general overview, and then hopefully there's lots of time at the end for discussions about uh, the current issues that we see um, in Japan, of course, but also maybe elsewhere in Asia and the world. Um, Yes, so my road roadmap for the talk. Um, of course, a very brief introduction on Japanese coastal commons will be given with a historical perspective. Um, and then if this, of course, leads to, I think, co-management of resources, right? When we're looking at commons resources and how they're accessed and managed in Japan. Um, and as a, as a matter of course, I think when we're looking at coastal resources, the fisheries are very important. And of course, much of my work is focused on uh, fishers and fishing livelihoods. So I'll talk a little bit about their livelihoods and their way of life, um, stemming in no small part due to their, their uh, proximity with the sea in the coastal areas. And then a little bit on uh, kind of the environmental and social conditions that we see today, um, because this is impacting obviously their lives and livelihoods, but also changing views of the sea and the coasts. And then ending um, with what this is all leading to uh, for me is this new fisheries law and the question of what does it mean for um, the coastal fisheries, coastal fishers and coastal commons. So, okay, so really very briefly, um, I imagine um, most people who are watching are maybe slightly familiar with the Japanese commons and know all this, but uh, just very, very briefly, uh, the commons areas and commons resources in Japan historically have been accessed via usufruct rights. So basically these are user rights, not ownership rights. And, and certainly when I was a student and then um, coming from a Western perspective, I think this is a very important point to kind of drive home is that there's not this conception of ownership, right, of the, of the commons resources and the commons areas, but rather just, just using. Um, and this ties back into how people's, when they're um, using, say, the fishing grounds, they often talk about protecting them, right? Because um, they've received it and using it from their ancestors and on to the next generation. So it's this idea of protecting and because you're only a user rather than an owner for your own profit, for example. So then historically, so people have had use rights to the resources. So, and it was up to the local institutions kind of to set conditions as to who can access and how they can access. And if we're looking at the, you know, the historic period, like in the Tokugawa area, this was often, for example, say a village headman. Um, um, yeah. And so, and the access then was often very much, it was very much place-based. Right, so you might have a, a coastal community in the coastal, the village headman, and, and they're the ones who are who are coordinating the access. Um, and so, and oftentimes communities had their own coastal areas that only they were allowed to access. Sometimes there's broader areas um, with, um, especially when you're thinking of pelagics, where a number of communities and groups might be accessing. But for the most part, when we're looking at the inshore coastal areas, it was very much place-based tied to specific, specific communities. And of course, the borders are marked and, and rules. And um, as you would expect, there were uh, sometimes or oftentimes, of course, conflicts and the, the uh, access was contested. But, but overall, um, access was regulated and it was understood who was, who was allowed to join, join or not. And when I'm talking about this is very much the uh, Tokugawa area. So say the uh, 17th to uh, mid 19th centuries. And for those who are interested, who might not be familiar, I really recommend you look at uh, Arnie Kaland, his work. Um, he has a wonderful book on um, fishing villages in Tokugawa, Japan, where he's done a lot of the historical um, background and looked into it. And it's very interesting because it gives a lot of local um, 
instances um, in different areas in Western Japan. So, um, so thinking of the commons, of course, automatically makes me and maybe many of us think about um, the ma accessing the coastal resources and how are we going to manage them, right? So. As I, as I just talked about, you know, in Tokugawa, Japan, they had a, had a certain set uh, way of doing things. And then we had this Meiji restoration. You know, the black ships arrived and at cannon points, the Japanese opened up their country. Um, and then as a process of this, what they call the Meiji restoration, this modernizing period, they, you know, they, they worked on um, changing, you know, their, their legal system, their education system, the infrastructure, you know, their huge, massive changes. Um, a little bit of civil war going in there as well, but you know a lot of changes going on in this period. And one of the changes was also coastal fisheries, um, and they actually made it open access following the Western model, as they did with education and other institutions. But very quickly, they figured out that this open access was a failure, um, and they actually backpedaled and they went back to following their more traditional uh, ways of of accessing coastal resources. Um, which I, I think is very, very interesting that, um, that they were able to say, no, this isn't working and we're going we're gonna to follow our more traditional models. And a part of this model then was fishery guilds. And I think most of us are familiar with the idea of a guild. Um, you get guilds with uh, many hand, handcrafts in um, many different areas in the world. Um, and so this was kind of then, the, it was the guild membership which helped then people gain access. Um, and these, many of these guilds, and of course there is a little bit of difference in different parts of Japan, but I'm speaking in general terms. And it was these guilds which then often formed uh, the basis of fishing cooperatives um, that, that came in succeeding um, decades. Um, and it was especially in say the 1930s when this big cooperative movement took off because as in many areas of the world that we see, uh, fishers were really often quite poor and they were very much, many of them were indebted, right, to the money lenders um, and to the mi middlemen who, you know, who would, who would help loan them money for, for purchasing equipment and these sorts of things. And so fishermen were very poor. So there's this big cooperative movement that took off in the 30s. And then following uh, World War II, a big national cooperative system was set up. So in 1948, the fisheries cooperative law was passed. And then in 1949, the fisheries law was passed. And these two laws are also very interesting because again, Western influence at this time period, it was the Supreme Command Allied Powers, SCAP, that was kind of running Japan in the immediate uh, sur surrender in post-war World War II period. And actually it was a lot of uh, discussion and arguments for over two years about these fisheries rights and access um, and in the end, uh, the Japanese, they won out and they, and they were able to um, put in this more uh, traditional model, uh, this cooperative system that followed uh, the fishery guilds. Um, and so up until today, this is pretty much how coastal commoners have accessed their coastal resources is through membership in a fishing cooperative. Um, the membership is decided on, on location and it's usually a household head who, who becomes the member. Um, So if we're thinking more of, of these fishing cooperatives, um, of course, um, there, there is a number of levels in Japan when we're looking at the fisheries. Um, but generally speaking, it's the prefecture who is kind of in charge. Um, and then the local, and that's delegated to the, to the local cooperatives, right? And each uh, cooperative, it depends on where you are. Some still very much have local place-based cooperatives. Others like in Miyagi, where I do a lot of my field work, they've all consolidated into one official cooperative for the whole prefecture. Um, but then you have what are called branch cooperatives, right? And it's really up to these branch or local cooperatives to kind of set their own uh, regulations, right? On how they're gonna operate um, and how they're gonna conserve or exploit their resources. Um, so in terms of the day-to-day, -day, it's, um, it's really you know, co-management and self-management that's going on. Um, and then when we're looking at fisheries resources, um, this isn't a Western idea of fish. This is a, a more and more Asian or at least Japanese idea of anything in the sea is considered fisheries, right? So we're talking about not just actual fish, but also um, 
cultivated things, um, shellfish, seaweed, and also things that you're diving for, right? So it's a very broad, holistic understanding of, of what fisheries are. And basically the FCAs, and this is important, especially when we're thinking about its history and their role in helping pulling fishers out of poverty, um, the FRC, FCAs are very multifunctional institutions, right? Um, so of course um, they play a role in how you're going to allow access and manage the resources, right? So where, where will you allow cultivation to take place? Where can you do set nets? Where, where are you gonna set aside as what are really, you know, basically marine protected areas, right? So this is, this is a major function of the FCA and the commoners who are members of FCAs, but also they have a banking system, they help with you know, advertising and you know, the marketing of the resources. So FCAs are very, very much um, multifunctional institutions. Um, okay, uh, yeah. Um, and then when I'm thinking, you know, I started my research, um, of course I'm an anthropologist, as John introduced, um, I'm very much interested in the peoples, um, but be I think probably because um, I'd only ever visited coastal communities and had never actually lived in one, I was very interested in how, and trying to understand, you know, this, this system that they had in place. But as an anthropologist, the system to me is only one, one thing I'm interested in, right? Obviously it's the commoners themselves that I also have a great interest in. So I'm interested in people's livelihoods and their way of life, right? And I think a lot of us um, understand that people's proximity to the sea and their resources, you know, have an impact on, on their local culture, right? Just as we know how our, how we interact, or how we interact with um, the coastal areas also then impacts, you know, the, the local ecology and environment. So if I'm thinking of, um, of maybe some some things that are you know that are impacted by being close to the seas you know for example there might be specific rituals um in the top left photo is um it's this is a ritual of greeting the new year it's sunrise on a new year so these guys um are going into the sea on the loincloth on on new year's day and um, you also just below it there's a photo you also have in in japan in august there's a obon which is kind of a an ancestor worship time when the when the ancestors come back the spirits return and they visit and you send them off again and so in in my main area of study and maybe in other areas as well they have what's called a hama obon so a beach obon um, so basically uh, it's this particular ceremony for um welcoming but also sending back uh, the spirits of people who've died at sea um, and for many of these people, it's, of course, family members um, who have passed away at sea, but also for the strangers who have washed up at shore historically, right, because you, um, you're taking care of the spirits and sending them away. So there's, there's lots of different rituals and, you know, festivals and different things going on, specifically because of, of being close to the sea. Um, also, if we're thinking of livelihoods and way of life, uh, technology is a, is a big important topic, right? New technology has come in. It's awfully maybe increased abilities to access resources. Um, for example, if we look at um, seaweeds in coastal areas, uh, traditionally they would have been uh, gathered by hand. Um, later people learned, say in the early uh, Tokugawa period, that if they set things in the water, uh, bamboo poles or tsubaki branches, then the seaweed would naturally adhere to it and then they could, they could uh, cultivate it, you know, they could harvest it this way. Um, and then technology progresses and actually in my main community of study by chance, they were the first people in Japan to figure out you could do rafts on the water um, and then and have the seaweed grow from that. And this was an important innovation because suddenly you weren't reliant on the seaweed traditionally would grow, say in coastal areas where you would have a, a, a high tide, low tide differentiation, right? Um, and now suddenly you could cultivate and, and harvest the resource in areas further offshore and not having to rely on the, on the up and down. So, so this is something that um, they've, they've enabled, you know, they've been able to access because of innovation in technology. Of course, on the flip side, um, then you might suddenly get over, um, over harvesting or, you know, and then, and then once again, this is where the cooperative system comes about and they, and they look into, you know, 
issues and then they might limit you know how you harvest i mean we know this in commons natural resource commons uh, throughout the world so suddenly in the fisheries area you might think oh um abalone is being over harvested so now okay we need to we need to step back and we scuba gear for example is available but we're going to say no you can't you can't use that you know to harvest so this this technology um there's kind of this give and take um and how people are using the technology and how then they decide to limit it um and then of course when i'm looking at, at livelihoods and way of life more of the way of life um i think there's a lot of societal change going on around the world uh, japan is no different um, and suddenly you're getting more people uh, with more leisure time, for example, and in, in starting to access or trying to access different um, uh, areas. And a part of this is now this, this big growth in water sports or um, recreational fishing. Um, and also, and I'll talk about it later, save the environment activities, right? So suddenly you get more and more people because traditionally those people who would access the commons uh, the coastal fishing commons, for example, are were people who worked it as a part of their livelihood. Um, and now we're getting a lot of um, more interest in people on a more recreational level. And this is also one of the things when I talked about a sea change in how you view commons is also I'm thinking of this rise in people who weren't uh, traditionally um, connected, um, you say through through their household livelihood, you know, you know, pattern. So this is this is a kind of a change in thinking. Um, some of the issues um, to start thinking about of um, when we're looking at changes in patterns, use patterns of the ocean and maybe accessing coastal commons, there's still a lot of feelings of protection, especially towards the fishing grounds by people who have held uh, traditional rights. So there's some anxiety there. Um, but we're also seeing, and this is what's leading to the new fisheries law, we see a big decline in the numbers of fishers. Now, traditionally, small-scale coastal fisheries are very important in Japan. More than 94% of the boats of the fleet are actually small-scale. And when we're talking about small-scale, these are like enterprise households, right? So these are very important uh, historically and even up into the, you know, almost current era. But now we're seeing a very big uh, decline. And so we're starting to see, well, not starting, but there has been conflicts in the coastal zone from time to time. Um, especially so much of Japanese development is disproportionately been on the coasts, right? Lots of land reclamation, lots of building, um, and people have sold uh, their, their use rights in order for this development to take place. Um, but there's also, there's often been a lot of conflict there and give and take. So, so there's been conflict with development and also now with maybe um, ideas, new usage, right? More and more recreational fishers wanting to come in, but then where are they going to place their boats, right? So, um, so there we're starting to get conflicts. And then another issue, but only in some areas of Japan is this idea of being cut off from the sea. So I'm working in Miyagi, which is in the Northeast coast of Japan. Um, my whole career has been here. Um, and many of you know about the 2011 uh, earthquake and tsunami. Um, and now J the Japanese government has built more than 600 kilometers of seawalls. Um, so, and this is something, another part of my research is looking at how this has impacted people's um, connection with the sea and how this impacts coastal culture actually to have suddenly have uh, not just the sea walls, but um, communities being rebuilt at quite a distance from the sea, right? So there's a, so there's a, a, a literal and figural distance now um, from commoners, you know, in, this, in the coastal commons. Um, all right, so uh, just some of these uh, environmental and social conditions I'm thinking of as I touched upon the demographic change. Um, so, for example, if you're looking at the elder population, um, it's say 23% on average in Japan, but in coastal communities, it's 32%. So the demographic shifts and changes we see throughout Japan are actually more accentuated and greater in coastal communities. Of course, there's ongoing uh, climate change, which are impacting various aspects of the environment. So from water temperature, species distribution, as a part of that, you also get changes in currents. Um, and then with the temperature changes and current changes, you often see more, uh, more disease. For example, among the seaweeds, um, there's a lot more problems with discoloration and red tides and these sorts of things. Um, then, um, 
partly because of, of 311 and the tsunami, I've also now been looking at disasters and how they're impacting communities and households and individuals. Um, and of course, there's always been many short-term events. Typhoons um, come through quite a bit. In the autumn, one year uh, when I was doing my doctoral fieldwork, when I was asking about, you know, have you ever thought about quitting? Um, and one guy was like, yeah, when the typhoon comes through. Um, and I thought, oh, okay. And then his wife, she laughed and she said, yeah, we had three come through. Um, and every time one came through, they had to, you know, redo. So there's these, and oftentimes people don't have insurance against something small, which they, you know, don't think comes very often. Um, but also in my community just last year, they had a, an oil spill, which had never happened before. It seemed in the prefecture, uh, there, was, there was a plan of action, but then no one actually used it. So there was a whole bunch of you know, uh, uncertainty and what do we do and a lot of delay in responding to this oil spill. Um, so we have these short-term events, uh, but then there's also the long impacting events, which as I mentioned, like the tsunami, uh, the Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear meltdown. Um, so there's a fourth disaster in Japan. Oh, the three disasters in Japan, of course, are the earthquake um, and the tsunami and the meltdown. Um, but in Japan, they talk about a fourth uh, disaster and that's the damage by rumors um, because uh, the seafood products, especially, but also other um, agricultural projects, you know, often have been banned and people are unsure about if they're safe or not. So this is another type of disaster for, um, oops, sorry, um, for fishers. Um, and then of course we have uh, Corona, COVID-19, which is also impacting uh, fishers and commoners, uh, you know, ability um, to, to work and live. So these are some of the, some of the issues that are going on today. Um, and then also we have, as I briefly alluded to, like with the rise of recreational, we have this changing views of the sea, I think, in the sense of um, how people are connected. Um, I wouldn't say, you know, do they have a right to be um, uh, a part of it, but suddenly I think people are feeling more a part of it or more a part of their lives, you know, the sea and the coastal areas. So we have um, these fishermen's forest movements, um, the Sato Umi, um, and citizen environmental movements, and then this rise of sea-related recreation that I've talked about. So I'll just briefly um, touch, upon, touch upon them. Um, so fishermen's forest movements, really interesting, and they've really grown in Japan, kind of began in the 1980s. Um, the most famous one is um, Moriwa Umi no Koibito, uh, which literally translate is as the forest is lover of the sea, right? So um, this uh, oyster fisherman um, really um, helped start this movement where they replant forests. So they're planting seas or trees um, in order to aid the, the water quality, you know, on the inshore area. Um, and it was really this one group um, which gains national attention. I remember seeing it on TV in the 19, 1999, 2000. Um, and so it was through this that um, it's really spread. I think, I think the very first one was in Hokkaido, maybe a little before this one, but it was really this one that got people's attention. Um, and now you get these groups throughout um, Japan where they're planting trees in order to improve the water quality um, in the inshore area. And hand in hand with this, we're seeing in society kind of this rise in volunteerism, right? So you get people from the coasts going to the mountains, and you get people in the mountains joining them um, to planting, but what we're seeing is that long-term sustainability is difficult, right? You know, getting people um, interested in maintaining over the years, but also access, accessing and maintaining ties. Um, the ties, maintaining ties is important, right? In order to keep it going, but also um, you find that a lot of times people will volunteer to help with the planting and then no one remembers to go back with this, with the long-term maintenance in order to help the forest really grow. Um, um, but it's a, it's a really interesting movement. And, and um, one of the fishermen I work with has started one more recently with a forest community. And their really interesting take on it is not just do the fishers and coastal people go to the mountains area to plant the trees, but then the people from the mountain inland areas, they come and they do this every other year. They come and they do a beach cleanup, right? So this otagaini, this way of helping one another out, um, is also then the, they're coming to the, to the beach area to, to, help, to help clean the beaches. 
So that's an interesting take on it. Um, and then Sato Umi, um, it's basically Sato Umi is a coastal area where the biological productivity and the biodiversity is increased through human interaction. So it's kind of like the cork forests in Portugal or the hedgerows in the United Kingdom, right? It's through it's through people's living and interacting with the environment and that you kind of change it and then, but then many times that also increases the, the biodiversity, right? Um, so this is a Japanese kind of native, native concept. So Sato means it's this area where people are living, like Furu Sato, when you talk about your hometown is Furu Sato, um, and Umi means the sea, right? And they also, it's also part of this concept is this, it's an important sea area where you have, um, it's like looking at a socio-ecological system, right, where you understand that humans are a part of the system. So you have, the area supports the culture, um, right, the way, the livelihoods and people, right, but it's also, um, and then the people are helping the productivity, right, and what's important in this concept of what is a Sato Umi, of course, is you're having the substance circulation, right, you're having this like watershed type circulation. Um, and you have the ecosystem working aspects, parts working together. And of course, people are there. And then also two other important parts is that you have in these activities and entities that perform the activities. So, so you know, uh, groups of people, associations, even fishing cooperatives, right? So all these together form this Sato Umi, this environment. Um, and then, of course, we have what I've already talked about briefly is kind of these citizen environmental movements. Now, um, if anyone of you know Margaret McKeon, she did some, she always does wonderful work, but one of the first things of hers that I read was this citizen protest and environmental movements in Japan from the 1970s. And of course, in these sorts of environmental movements, you're getting people protesting, say, the land reclamation and polluting industries that are going in in the coastal areas. Um, the kind of environmental movement I'm talking about is more of people feeling uh, more now a part of the greater world and especially of this, the coastal commons, right? Um, and so as a part of this, people are you know feeling connected and then also be, then being more active in the area. So this might include you know nature walks and hands-on activities, but also like I've talked about these beach cleanups, right? You'll get beach cleanups. I mean the fishing uh, cooperative association members, the women's groups have always done you know beach cleanups and you know um, promoting uh, a cleaner environment. But now you're getting the broader community taking part in beach cleanups, not just on the coasts, um, but some some IAC members, for example, also are in charge of these big pla anti-plastic campaigns and the, the working in the rivers, not just in the coasts. And then of course, there's a lot of uh, habitat restoration um, going on. And the, 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 the picture in the, the lower right there is of the Matsushima Bay area showing um, kind of the seagrass areas, um, which were almost completely destroyed in the tsunami uh, and wiped away. And now there are these movements to reseed and regrow the eelgrass and, um, and it's this broader community um, that's been working on this. But of course, when you get some of these activities, oftentimes it's with the support of local commoners, but sometimes it's um, in conflict. So for example, um, reseeding, regrowing some of the seagrass beds, then, um, then suddenly that's area that maybe the people wanted to use for seaweed or for oyster aquaculture. So sometimes you get a little bit of conflict with the placement, even if people understand the overall importance of, of the issue and of the importance of seagrass um, in the local ecosystem and the environment. Um, okay, and all of this kind of brings me um, to the new fisheries law. So for me, all this is kind of in the background of things I know and things I'm interested in. And then suddenly, I think 2019, uh, Japan announced this new fisheries law. And of course, immediately for me and for a number of other academics and commoners, this raises a lot of red flags. You know, what does, what, what does this mean for us and for them? Um, obviously, one of the things that's pushed it along is this uh, demographics change, right? Um, and these issues, these um, worldwide interest, of course, in sustainability. Um, and of course, in some areas, I'm coming from Europe, 
um, where um, a lot of the fisheries are done on a quota system and, and they're privatizing uh, the fisheries. So that's immediately why this kind of raises some red flags. Um, now, of course, there, it's still under, under review and to see how it goes. And of course, they're still trying to differentiate between the, say, pelagic offshore uh, migratory species and the, the kind of near offshore uh, trawler type system as opposed to the coastal inshore family enterprise um, fisheries. So, I mean, they're saying they still will retain the right system and they will review to see, you know, what is the proper tools. Um, but it's a big, it's a big question now. And unfortunately, um, I had planned to be working on this issue all year, um, but because of Corona, COVID-19, I was actually locked out of Japan for the last six months. So I haven't, you know, my own research hasn't gone as far as I would have liked at this point, but this is something I've started looking into and I'm going to continue to look into. And, and again, um, and maybe some of the Japanese who might be on the line might um, have some interesting insights or might have some, uh, we might have some interesting discussions with them. But for me, um, what the main red flag is when you talk, when you look at the, at the ministry and what they're writing, you know, one of the things they're saying is the reason for the reform is that we're trying to encourage the effective use of coastal waters, right? Because they're seeing this demographic change. Um, and they want to protect the rights who are utilizing the waters properly and effectively, but also strategically to reconstruct, particularly aquaculture. And, um, and so, as I said, this for me is kind of a red flag. Um, are we looking at economic efficiency? What do they mean by, you know, effective um, and efficient? And what are they thinking of reconstructing? Um, because they're looking, they're coming at this from a Western finally these western ideas of a maximum sustainable yield like so so the the issue is the fisheries aren't now being looked at um as um they're not looking at this as a resource management like protecting and managing they're looking at it more as how can we maximize the use right so it's a very different um way of thinking and of course there's this individual quota system which being introduced it's not an individual transferable quota system yet, but when we're looking at small scale fishers, coastals throughout Europe and the United States, um, especially in Northern Europe, massive decline in the small scale local, you know, coastal commoners. So this is, this is why it's a big red flag for me. And, and, that, and this is also part of maybe the, a change in thinking of the coastal commons, right? Who has, who has access, who should be allowed access. Um, so just some concluding thoughts. Um, the new fisheries law is a top-down imposition. It took a lot of people by surprise. So there's a lot of anxiety and uncertainty uh, among the, the coastal commoners, but also among researchers alike. Again, it's tied in no small part to the fact that the I, IQ system isn't really a resource management system like it's today. It's really a maximize, you know, taking out using the resources kind of system. Of course, as is highlighted by many in JF Fisheries and the Fisheries Administration, the National Ministry, um, the coastal fishers already use many different tools for managing their commons, you know, um, marine protected areas. There's more than a thousand in Japan that are, that are put in place by fishers themselves, by commoners themselves. There's an input output, there's seasonal, um, you know, seasons. And so there's already many different tools. So an IQ, system is just one more tool but then the, for me the question is you know what really how big of a role it will take um and then of course it could possibly overstated be overstated uh, i think not um because many people's interest in the uh, coastal commons of course is an economic one right households being able to access the resources but also i'm looking at it culturally and um a lot of wives especially talked about this idea of protecting the commons, right? They've received it um, and they hope to give it, you know, access to future generations. So the idea of protecting the commons um, and also, you know, using it, of course, and it's a different, it's a different mindset, right? So community members are very much afraid of these newcomers coming in with more of a business mindset. If you have a downturn in uh, resource access for a couple of years, a business will just get out 
like I said, it's not profitable for leaving. Um, they don't have a long-term perspective as the commoner, you know, individual householders do. So, um, so those are some of the the issues that are going on right now in uh, in the coastal commons. So, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aline, for that very excellent presentation. Uh, highlighting the coastal commons in Japan today, as well as uh, probably the threats uh, associated uh, with the recent assertion of the state in terms of coming up with uh, a new law, uh, hopefully to manage well, but with, with some implications uh, to the local communities. Uh, we have a very interesting question uh, on the Q&A box, uh, and let me read it for uh, Elaine to answer. Uh, it came from uh, Professor uh, Makoto Inoue, uh, who is uh, actually an executive uh, committee member of uh, the International Association for the Study of the Commons. Uh, so uh, he noted here, thank you for the interesting presentation. I would like to ask you two questions. The first is, how are conflicts between the traditional right holders, referring to the fishermen, and outsiders settled? So it's along the lines of uh, conflict management. How are these settled? Traditional right holders on the one hand, particularly the fishermen and the, outsi uh, and the outsiders. And secondly, are there any systems or mechanisms to settle the conflicts? Uh, so that's uh, a follow-through question. But the second question is, I would like to know the impact of the concept of Satoumi on the attitude of fishermen. So uh, impact, uh, of the concept of Satoumi on the attitude of the fishermen. So uh, those two excellent questions, we leave to Elaine to answer. Thank you, Elaine. Okay. Thank you, John. And thank you, Mark, for your uh, very good questions. Um, I'm used to more of a dialogue, as I think we all are in a live situation where we can have a discussion with others who might be more knowledgeable than myself. Um, but when I'm looking at my, in my local level situation in terms of um, conflicts, say between um, the local commoners and, and say, and a big thing I might think of is say recreational fishers, right? Who want um, to gain access to not only uh, the fishing areas, but also to the coastal wharves, right? They need a place to put their boats. And in this situation that I know of in my community, oftentimes it's the, uh, it's the fishing cooperative, um, sometimes with the uh, city hall. Um, and then they're, they're working at a top, you know, top level with the, with the, with the other, you know, association. So it's more of a kind of an institution to institutional uh, interaction um, when they're trying to settle the conflicts. Um, I think, as we know, um, in Japan, also interpersonal uh, connections also, you know, have a role to play here. And um, Japan also is very much, um, they work towards consensus on decision making. So oftentimes, um, it's a part of these, I think, interpersonal and interactions and connections, working with these uh, more formal institutions where you're trying to then, you know, to gain a consensus. Um, certainly in the, in some of the local ports, um, in one area they were able to, um, is basically because of the decline in fishers, they were able to, and finally were willing to give up some of their uh, local space. In another port community in the town, the actually the Kumuna along with the prefectural government, they actually built a separate area for, for more of the yachts and the more leisure craft. So we kind of see a combination of, of opening up um, the, the um, wharf uh, Gampeki area um, or also sometimes making a side area. 
um, hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, if not, you can, you can write again. Um, in terms of the Sato Umi attitude of fishermen, uh, that's a very good question. I actually haven't um, officially focused on this, but um, from my interactions with fishers, I think to me, it's actually, when we talk about Sato Umi, we're actually making explicit um, a concept and an idea that's often very implicit, I think, to people and kind of unconscious. So um, for me, I think when I've spoken with fishermen about their, their work and life in the area, I think it's, you know, it's kind of this implicit understanding of being a part of the local, of, the, of this ecolo socio-ecological system. Um, yeah, so to me, their attitude is, yeah, that they're a part of it and their activities are a part of it and they understand about this concept of, say, this uh, greater watershed. But then, of course, this also brings in conflict because so much of their area is impacted by parts, you know, up, upstream, so to say. I don't know if that answers your questions, but um, hopefully. Um, Thank you so much, um, Mac, for the question, and also Aline for the answer. Uh, we have additional question from uh, our participants, and that is, can you talk about your plans ahead to study the new legislation that is underway? Ah, uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, my plans. Well, my plans are to continue what I've started when I just got back in this last week or two um, to speak with other researchers um, to see what's going on um, in their areas, what they understand. I've also started speaking with uh, the National Japan Fisheries Federation Zen Gyoden to get their take on, on this new law. Um, what are any red flags, if any, for them? You know, what do they actually see as opportunities? Um, I'm trying to not, you know, be biased just because I automatically have a knee-jerk reaction of, oh, this could have a negative impact. We know there could also be positive impacts. Um, so I guess my, and then um, even though uh, Corona has curtailed a bit of field work, um, we're able to, for example, do, you know, one-on-one -on -one interviews. So my plans are to, to go in my long-term field site, Shichingahama, of course, and to start speaking with people um, about everything that's going on right now. So including Corona, but also this, have they heard about the new fisheries law? You know, what does this mean? What are their concerns? Um, I already know a little bit, um, <laughs> this example of the short-term uh, economic mindset was already mentioned to me um, last year by some fishers. So, so I guess my plans are to, to reach out with other um, researchers, actually a workshop on it. I attended the uh, Northeast Japan economics, fisheries economics uh, workshop last year. So it could be time to have another workshop. So reaching out with other um, researchers, uh, doing the field work, with various stakeholders, so people in the ministry, people in the National Fisheries Federation, in the local cooperatives and local fishers, um, in my main field site, of course, and then also I'm working on some comparative work elsewhere in Miyagi Prefecture. But I've learned, um, I was a bit naive when I was a graduate student, I thought Miyagi was kind of proxy for all of Japan, but I, I'm learning that things can be quite different throughout Japan, so it'd also be good um, to kind of travel elsewhere and do some comparative work as well. Um, but I, so I think my plans are, might be what you see with a lot of different types of, of field work, right? Speak with uh, representatives of official organizations and then speak with the, the local, local people and then connect, connect with other researchers. Thank you. As, as Aline was mentioning, this is also some sort of a dialogue so uh, I think uh, what strikes me most is uh, the parallelism of uh, the coastal commons in Japan vis-a-vis uh, -vis the other types of commons in Asia. Uh, for instance, I work in forestry commons, uh, forest in particular, and I can see a very strong parallelism of the situation there. 
uh, starting, for instance, with the use of procrite in the context of the Philippines, for instance, uh, our uh, uh, indigenous people say that uh, you can you can on, you can only use the land, but uh, because the land is there forever, uh, it's it's the land who owns you. It's not you who owns the land, uh, which uh, uh, I think is a very interesting uh, argument. But at the same time, well, with the assertion, with the nationalization of the forest, uh, with the assertion of the state uh, towards a better, so-called a better management, uh, following the sustainable principle, uh, then essentially uh, there is this now uh, seemingly conflict uh, and continuous, you know, uh, tension, I would say, as far as uh, the, the traditional use, which has uh, actually been overshadowed uh, with the uh, loss or imposition of the loss of the state. But I can see that in many other commons, uh, and I think uh, this is where the relevance of uh, Aline's work uh, comes in as far as the other forms of commons are, uh, are, are concerned, is that you have here what I would say tidal waves of changes uh, that is confronting many commons of the world, uh, ranging from economic change, environmental change on the one hand, and also, as I've said, the continuous assertion of the state uh, to control the resources, uh, supposedly for the for the uh, broader good of the society, uh, but whether it will uh, result uh, to that one uh, remains to be seen. Uh, but my question uh, really is, Elaine, uh, what do you think is your prognosis as to the uh, future of the of the coastal commons in Japan? Uh, considering, uh, again, uh, the tidal waves of changes, demographics, socioeconomic, environmental on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, seemingly the interest in terms of the social movements uh, to in a way uh, also exert their influence, uh, rediscovering the good harmony between humans and nature, which is again parallel in the forestry sector. If you talk about Satu Umi and forestry, they are also talking about Satu Yama, which is again another parallelism. So what do you think is the future of our commons uh, as far as these changes are concerned? Thank you so much. Thank you, John, for your words and for your question. Oh, what's, what's my prognosis? Um, yeah, I think I think I finally learned to say I have you know I had no idea. It's it's funny because when I first was an undergraduate, I, I first went to this community to do interviews, a very naive you know ethnographic interviews with the wives of fishermen. And so in 1991, they said, "Oh, in 10 years there will be no fishers left." And then in 1999, 2001, I'm back. So in 2001, they say, "Oh." In 10 years, there'll be no one left. And of course, there are people left, right, um, each time. And so in 2011, you think, oh, when they say, oh, there won't be anyone left. Oh, but the tsunami hit and suddenly half are gone. So, okay, maybe finally, but you know, we don't know when the tsunami is gonna hit. And, and as you talk about these tidal waves of change, um, we really don't know. But despite these decades of people saying, oh, there will be no one left because they're talking about, you know, decline and, um, I do think actually it feels like suddenly now there's a there's a more rapid decline or as you say there are a lot more um, external factors you know pressures I think going on so so definitely in terms of say fishing cooperative association membership um, and more traditional uh, historically you know accessed commoners I think, yeah, there's definitely now, it's at a tipping point, I think, and there really will be a change. I mean, I'm not, I'm not a betting person, um, but it really feels like now there's definitely changes going on. 
Um, in terms of these social movements, of course, as I talked about, you know, fishermen's what, uh, um, the Fujinbu, the wives, you know, the female organizations, they've always pushed um, for community cleanups. Um, but it, I really do think it's a change. You're getting more of, say, the suburban or unconnected people starting to um, be active. And, um, and I think that is only for the best. I think there can only be good that's coming from it as more people feel um, a connection and therefore maybe they also feel protective, right? Um, so, you know, this is move and, and um, one of the research um, projects I'm on now is actually, it's unusual in Japan, but we've gotten together to compare, you know, forestry and urban, urban forestry and fisheries commons. We have a small research project now where we're comparing this and in the field trip I did last year to the mountain forest area, you also are getting different types of people, you know, coming in and, and trying to join in protecting and, you know, accessing. So there are different um, forms taking, you know, taking place now with the different comments where you're getting more um, people who aren't necessarily, you know, traditionally active traditionally active. Some are maybe in the same community, but newcomers, but others are from outside the community. So it's, I think it'll be interesting to see how this plays out and the different forms that are taking, but either way, how it happens, there will be a lot, um, I think a lot more, um, say, formerly non-connected people now feeling connected and taking part. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Alin. Uh, I think that was uh, short but uh, sweet and very fruitful discussion as well. So in the interest of time, I would like to turn over uh, the uh, uh, discussion to uh, our colleague, uh, Charlie. Uh, Charlie? Thanks, Jan. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and see me. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm tempted to say we have a nice audience, a nice sized audience. I'm tempted to say, you know, is there anyone before we close any last uh, question or, or uh, uh, to be asked? I just wanted to make sure. It, okay, it looks like we're okay to, to go to the closing. Uh, uh, Aline, can you go to the next slide? Yep, I Thanks. think. Uh, um, yeah, and so uh, 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 let me just close now um, uh, this IASC Asia Regional Keynote Address with a few final points. Um, one I wanted to just point out, um, as I said in the beginning, this is the actually the closing event of the, the World Commons Week. Um, the, the first event was the launch in person in Bloomington, Indiana of the uh, Governing the Commons uh, 30th anniversary celebration. And then we had a whole variety for people who may, maybe didn't um, see these, we had a whole variety of keynote talks, one for each region, IASC region. So you're seeing the North America one, which started it. Um, next slide. Oh, hold on. Okay. Uh, then we moved to Latin America. I'm sorry, go, yeah, go up one. Uh oh. Really? Okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Sorry. <laughs> so then we had Latin America. Uh, Fabio uh, gave a great talk. I unfortunately don't speak Spanish, but based on the questions and the, the dynamic nature of the talk, it, it was clearly wonderful. Um, one of the points I want to make is on the World Commons Week um, URL at the bottom of the screen, These, all of these have been recorded. So if you're curious to see these, um, go there and they're already up for your, um, you, you, you can uh, watch them. Next slide. We then moved to Africa, and this was the Africa keynote that happened a few days ago. Um, next slide. We moved to Oceana, um, where we had, um, in this case, it was a unusual uh, keynote in that um, 30 minutes of it was a, a, a introduction of a documentary that she had put together really beautiful documentary um, film. And, uh, and then, but um, she didn't want to put that documentary up on the site. So it's not there, uh, but what is there is the Q and A. And then um, she 
actually is willing to share the, the documentary, but uh, she wants you to email her. So the email is on this site if you want to see the documentary. I'd really encourage you to see it. It's really wonderful. Next slide. Uh, then we had Europe. Um, the keynote for Europe, which was in a topic very similar to this one and a very interesting one. And Aline, I noticed you had actually a, a slide where you were referencing one of, uh, one, of a, uh, 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 one of the points made in the talk. Um, next slide. Uh, we had China um, that I still don't have the video yet, quite yet. It just happened yesterday. Um, so, but that's the China keynote. Next slide, I'm almost done. <laughs> and today, this morning, um, my time, um, we had a, a really wonderful event, um, which was the first time we've done this in World Commons Week, which was the Early Career Network um, had pulled together a set of five panelists. Um, and that's really wonderful energy that's uh, occurring within IASC is this um, growing network of um, early career scholars. Next slide. And then, of course, we, we closed with today's keynote that you just watched. I want to point out that there's been also online local events happening. Um, this year in the year of the pandemic, of course, um, they've mostly been online. But I'm happy to say that we're now at a higher level of locations participating than has happened in previous years. So we're on a growth curve. Um, I want to plant a seed if anyone, um, well, when, when we were in Peru, I was uh, really, it was wonderful to see the, the energy of the Asia, um, ISC Asia group. And I just want to plant the seed that next year, um, it's not too early to start thinking now about a possible local event for next year in, in, in the Asia region, one or more or many. Um, next slide. And the last thing I'll just say is, uh, you, as you may know, the, uh, the, the biannual conference is coming up next year at Arizona State University. Of course, we don't know with the pandemic what exactly it's gonna be like at this point, but on the left-hand side of the uh, slide, you can see the timeline um, and it will go on whether it's in person or if it turns out to be an online event. Um, but I wanted to bring your attention to also the pre-conference virtual events, which is a, a new thing in part because of the pandemic uh, where we're having um, sets of uh, online conferences starting in February of 2021. And so uh, I'm just encouraging you to um, consider these um, websites for these events are, are starting to show up on the ISC Commons website. Um, last slide. So I, I just want to close um, on behalf of IASC and all of the World Commons Week 2020 organizers. Um, I'd like to thank all the attendees, and we have a really nice set of them here, for your time and attention today. I want to thank John and also Mac, who's um, one of the attendees, for helping organize this keynote, and especially to Aline for preparing and giving this really interesting keynote address. Um, we have no way to clap but feel free to raise your hand in the participants window and let's give her a high five <laughs> for, and there, there's some hands. <laughs> I love that. That's fun to watch. <laughs> um, so this, this concludes the IASC Asia region world commons week keynote webinar. Thank you all for attending and enjoy the rest of your day. And if you're not a member of IASC, um, the, uh, consider joining if you like what you're seeing. Um, you can see the URL on the screen that'll tell you where to go. So with that, we'll close. I'm going to turn the recording off. Um, Aline, I don't know if you want to just stay around for a few more minutes. And, and uh, John, in case anybody wants to stick around and, and talk through, uh, you know, audio. Um, thank you, everyone, again. Thank you.